All right, this is great. I get an applause, although I didn't even say a single word yet. So this seems to be a very nice audience. And I know it's late in the evening, so I'm pretty thankful and I feel very honored that you all are still here. And um, I'm here in several roles as a guest lecturer, of course, as you can see, and also as an entrepreneur, which does several kinds of businesses. And while doing these businesses, I have a certain approach, a certain idea of how to do them, which typically don't match what you tend to learn at the university. So I studied myself um, business psychology and had to learn lots of things about how the system of um, economics work, how a whole, um, um, a whole um, I don't get the word, how companies work actually, how markets work and so on. And most of the time I felt like these rules I was supposed to learn, I actually didn't like them. So I want to try to rewrite these rules. And I think this is actually possible to do. So I'm kind of inviting you, this is the purpose of my whole talk, to uh, while you are studying and also later on, listen to everybody, learn, and then rewrite the rules so you actually like them. So I'm kind of asking you not to believe your professor. Listen to them carefully, of course, but don't believe everything they say because they might, might not be um, aware that things can be run differently than they actually teach. Although I like Laura very much and everybody here, but maybe they, there's some tweak uh, needed. So imagine myself as a kind of hacker personality looking at systems and finding systems which I actually don't like and then trying to hack them. So I look at systems similar to a computer system and uh, try to tweak them and change them and make them actually better. And the result of all this is then a cola. So it's a tangible product, it's a drink. And as you can see, this is pretty much minimalistic in design. So this is uncommon for the industry. Typically these bottles have to have lots of colors, three labels, they need to attract you as consumers and so on. And we felt we should tone this down and make this as minimalistic as possible in design terms, but also in ecological terms. So this is a glass bottle, of course. We don't use any plastics. And we have, of course, returnable bottles only. And there's only one label, of course, with recycled paper in it. And there's even vegan glue for that label. So we um, optimize lots of things. And we sell this bottle 1.5 million times per year in three German-speaking countries, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And we only do sell in these countries because we found out that the ecological footprint of selling further abroad would be just too big. And the problem is that we are causing too much pollution as human society. So right now we are using 1.6 planets, the resources of 1.6 planets as a whole human society, but we do only have one planet. So we need to tone this down as well. And of course, we do get inquiries from European countries, but also from India, from Taiwan, from China, from the United Arab Emirates, and so on. And we usually re reply, thank you for inquiring, but we cannot deliver due to the ecological limitations of our planet. We do only have one, so we need to tone this down. And typically, there's replies after that. So one guy from India asked, what if I pick it up from Germany? <laughs> well, it's the same distance. We had an interesting conversation. But uh, yeah, that's basically it. So we sell drinks to German-speaking countries, and uh, that's it. And, but we kind of had, have narrowed down the area of distribution, so we are kind of giving away possible revenue. And when I'm talking about the phrase we, then typical, the typical approach of running a company is that the company consists of a building, maybe an office building. There's people employed who go there, and this is the actual company, maybe some machines, some cars. So this is the area of responsibility, the things you own. Now, I feel that the area of responsibility should be widened a little, because the things we own is just here, our small company, and we don't even have an office, so there's no building to visit but we produce and sell and deliver bottles. So we have partners which we in, uh, uh, interact with. For example, we do have our suppliers for the ingredients. We do have two bottling plants. We have a customs agency. We have trucking companies. We have wholesalers, drinks dealers, and club and bar owners. And we have people who program stuff and all kinds of people, all kinds of partners which we interact with. So we have effects on them and they interact with us, so they have effects on us. So it's a kind of networked, um, networked business system. And therefore, I do believe that the responsibility does not end at the formal limitations of the company. But in fact, we have to treat 
all of these partners like they were internal partners. So 1,700 commercial partners, which we collected over se nearly 17 years of running the business, and we try to treat them as internal partners, all of them. And with internal partners, of course, we have negotiations. We discuss about deliveries, about pricing, about everything. And then we agree on some solution. And then we consider this solution temporarily. So we don't write them, we write them down sometimes, but we don't use uh, written contracts. So the idea of a written contract basically is that you agree on something and write it down and si sign it. And then this um, contract should remain stable for like a year or three years or something to give both sides some kind of stability. But the problem is that this is not a stable image. There's always some change. So for example, we change, the industry changes, some road changes, there's change all the time. So we need to be kind of flexible and need to be able to adapt the former um, results we had. So I think we shouldn't do any written contracts which we did. So nearly 17 years of running the company, we, I never signed any written contract with the commercial partners, which means that we can renegotiate any agreement at any given moment. And which also means that we have to treat all of these partners so well that they actually stay because nobody has to stay. And we need these partners, of course, for deliveries, for filling of the bottles, for logistics, for sales, for storage, for all kinds of things. So we have to treat them so well that they actually stay and they have to treat us so well that we actually stay. So we both need each other and then we have to come up with a better solution if something changes. And I've seen some skeptical faces here and there. So maybe you start to think that the idea of having no written contracts tends to be to lead to an unstable cooperation, to cause lots of problems, to cause lots of misunderstandings and lots of problem, uh, problems maybe. And I can assure you that this, of course, is a little bit more complicated if you don't have written agreements just to, to show somebody, to force him to do something. You have to negotiate maybe more often. But I think that you will have more happy partners in this network than if you force somebody to do something with a written contract. And I can prove this with the very low level of uh, no low number of people we actually lost. So uh, we run this company for nearly 17 years and we lost less than 2% of our commercial partners, which is very low. And also it's more efficient because if you have partners and know them and are working together for several years, then it's uh, more efficient than to find and convince and um, implement new partners all the time. And also <coughs> I managed to run the company for 17 years now, in November it's 17 years, without a single lawsuit. So we never had a lawsuit. And when I'm asked if I'm successful as an entrepreneur, then I'm, then I'm giving these numbers. Nearly 17 years, 1,700 commercial partners, zero written contracts, zero lawsuits. And I feel this is a success. Why is this a success? Why did this work? I think that every group of people, basically, every company, every organization needs uh, three uh, aspects of leadership. And one aspect of leadership is to give a very clear idea what the company is about. And this company, at least that's how I would put it, is not about selling drinks, but it's about the equal dignity of, of, of humans, basically. So humans concerning gender, uh, color of skin, origin of country, this should be no big deal at all. And also which about humans which maybe have a company, own something, they are not, at least that's how I put it, better humans or have more kind of worth than people who work for the company. And people who are kind of big customers tend to be more important to regular companies, but I feel these are humans. This is one human, big customer, one human, a small customer. Somebody who works in an internal structure, is employed, is one human, and is, he's not more a human than somebody which is working in an external um, fashion. So. The idea is that we should have the equal dignity of humans basically throughout the world. And of course, this is uh, not the case. So if you uh, are rich, then you have more access to power and to resources than if you are poor. If you have a big company, then you don't have to obey all the laws and you don't have to obey all the tax regulations, which is pretty bad. 
And if you are born to the wrong country, then you might not be allowed to travel or even to flee if there is a war. So this is a pretty bad situation of the whole planet, which I personally can't change. I'm not the boss of the planet, unfortunately. But with the business world, maybe I can put some change there and try to establish the human dignity of uh, the equal dignity of humans to the business world. And with these kind of hippie-ish thoughts, I was drinking a Coke 19 years ago. And uh, this is a German brand. It's Afri-Cola. You might not even know it. And this was my favorite brand of cola. And I drank it. And then I found out that, they, that it tasted differently. So obviously, they had changed the recipe without telling me. <laughs> but I'm the consumer. So I'm buying these bottles. And by doing so, I'm actually founding the company. So I might not be their boss, but I'm the foundation of that company as a consumer with a small fraction, with one bottle, but I'm the foundation. So I called them and visited them and explained to them that we have to find a method of them informing us consumers when they want to change something. And also, we have to find a method <coughs> of us consumers taking part in these decisions, because we actually found the fund the company. And they didn't agree, because they thought the company is theirs. They own it, so they are taking the decisions. And I was discussing with them for two years. And in the end, I didn't make it. They didn't uh, get the idea. So I founded my own. It's pretty easy in Germany to enter the drinks industry. You just find a syrup producer with the original cola re recipe. Then you find a bottling plant, give the order like 50,000 bottles if you are unlucky, 1,000 bottles if you are lucky. So I brought 1,000 euros and had 1,000 bottles of cola, and that was it. And then I could have kind of switched sides, right? be the official owner and give the decisions. But this is against my main idea that I don't want to have owners taking the decisions. So I had no idea what to do. And if you have no idea what to do, then you ask other people. So I asked the bottling plant owner, Alex, please come to Hamburg and tell me uh, what, you do, what you need, uh, how much share you should have, how the process should be made, how much time the process takes. So please explain so I can learn. Then I asked the first club and bar owner to come to the same table and explain to us, what do you need? What's your idea? What are your wishes and needs? And so I invited everybody virtually, which we have any connection with, to bring their ideas and thoughts and experience and knowledge. And then I offered them in return, we will decide together. So not I will be taking the decision, but we will be deciding together. And this is basically the whole secret of the company. We invite everybody and co-decide. That's basically it. So we met the first year in a local club in Hamburg and talked for hours and hours and hours, you can imagine, right? So if you have a ex similar experience with um, group discussions, these can take ages, <coughs> which they did in the beginning. But like after a year or so, we kind of had found ourselves, found some solutions, and things got pretty smooth. So we were able to distribute to other cities. So I started in Hamburg, where I live and found some customers there and invited everybody and then we started there. And then after one year we moved to other cities and uh, sold the cola there as well. And then at the latest moment in the company's history maybe, I would have to have an actual founding process. Like for example, buy a, buy a truck, buy a, a rent a storage, invest in advertising, invest in sales people, invest, 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 but I didn't have the money. So the typical approach, which you will be taught in business school probably, is to have a business proposal, go to some investor, collect the money, and then start and give full force and work hard to reach the break even in a time frame of three years. But that's the problem, because if you have a time frame for, of three years, and the pressure from the investor, he wants his money back, plus the revenue, then you have to push sales, then you have to have advertising, then you have to push the sales people maybe. You have to force somebody who can't pay right now to pay uh, on time. So there's all kinds of, I'm making fists, so there's all kinds of pressure going into the system if you pour in the pressure from an investor from above. So this is something I didn't want to do, of course. So I avoided it, basically. So I didn't have any business proposal. I didn't have any strategy written down. I st still don't have. 
And I just kept working as quick as I could. So for example, I went by car to Berlin, brought some crates, met some people there and set it up and had a few customers and then things went stable. And then I moved to Leipzig and then I moved to Cologne at a speed which I could manage and not the speed of an investor. And by doing so, I had plenty of time to think and to rethink and to discuss and to find solutions and to find solutions with everybody and to co-decide and have the company grow in a kind of sustainable fashion. And to be honest, it took me seven and a half years to actually have a share for myself when the bottle is sold and eight and a half years to make a living from it. So I had other jobs, of course, but I feel this was the kind of healthy way to build up the company. If it's possible, avoid investors and just build it up at your own speed, which you can manage. All right, and then we, of course, entered the the system of uh, the, the drinks industry. And we found out there's several things which kind of are being predefined. For example, roads where the trucks can drive or laws which you have to print on the bottle and so on. So there's lots of things which you can't argue. But there's also other things which you might, 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 might be able to kind of argue with and maybe hack. For example, there's uh, the written and unwritten rule that a big customer will get a smaller price because he is buying more, which is more efficient. So there's a volume discount, which is standard in most industries. And the volume discount in the drinks industry means that there's actually two volume discounts because when you have a truck driving, the logistics will get cheaper if you have a bigger truck with more bottles in it. And then if you add a volume discount for the big wholesaler uh, on top, then the uh, big wholesaler would, would earn twice just because it's, he's big, which is against the main idea of equal dignity of people. You can't give somebody a twice the share just because he's big. He doesn't even need it because he's big. So we discussed and set the rule that we don't have a volume discount. So no matter how big any customer might be, there's no volume discount. And we found out that actually the small drink dealers, they have higher transportation costs per unit, so they need an anti-volume discount. All right, it's pretty logic, right? So the small dealership, again, has the higher transportation costs, so they need an anti-volume discount. And we still left the volume discount by, tr by the transport in the system because it's reasonable for the environment to combine these deliveries to bigger trucks. But then we added this idea of the anti-volume discount for smaller dealers because they need it, right? This is my favorite. This is so, I think it's, I don't get the idea why not everybody, everybody's not doing this. All right, by doing so, we have more small dealerships than other drinks producers, which stabilizes our distribution chain. We have an easier entry in new cities where the amounts are small at the beginning, so there's an anti-volume discount, so it's uh, bearable. And we have invited the anti-volume discount and put this in the book of economics. And there are right now three books where this is actually written down, so this is an alternative. You can have volume discounts, of course, but you also can have anti-volume discounts. Then we discussed with everybody and found out that we cannot discuss everything with everybody. There's just not, not enough time to do so. And we also found out that it's not necessary to, to discuss everything with everybody because the, the effect which uh, we have is on different scales. For example, we do have decisions which personally affect you primarily as a worker. So for example, where you work, what you work, how long you work, with which tools you work and so on. This is your personal life, so you should be deciding about these questions. And these are many decisions, of course, which you have to decide on any given day. Then we have decisions which affect a group, maybe your coworkers, when you plan your holidays or something. So you have to invite the people who are affected by your decision and decide with them together. And this applies no matter where they are actually, formally speaking, where they are located. So if you, for example, have logistics to deliver to a festival, then you have to invite your coworkers, of course, which are affected, but you also have to invite the trucking company and the guys from the festival, the guys and girls, and maybe even the neighbors, when do they want to have these trucks passing by? So you need to invite everybody which is affected. And there are, of course, some decisions which uh, affect the whole company. So you have to invite everybody, to everybody who is affected by the whole company, at least that's how I see it, because they are affected and they are humans and they have basic human dignity, so they should be invited to the decision making. And this is the other way around as standard companies would do so. 
for uh, in standard companies, the more important a decision is, so the more people which are affected by a decision, the higher up in the hierarchy uh, the decision will be taken, so it's fewer people. So the more important a decision is, the fewer people higher up the hierarchy chain would actually uh, take the decision, which absolutely doesn't make any sense at all to me, so we need to turn this down, and if something is very important, we have to invite everybody to it. And then we need to come up with a decision method which is as democratic as possible and still a, um, a working model for running the business. And we feel that we need to give the power to everybody to actually avoid a decision to his or her ad disadvantage, maybe uh, to his or her own disadvantage or to somebody else's. So we feel we need to reach consensus in the de decisions we take. So we put out our concept of decision making, it fits on one slide, it's called consensus democracy. We have to have the common goal of the equal dignity of people before, so this is kind of undemocratic because I said it, this is the, the main goal I want to reach with the company and if you don't like this goal then we, we cannot work together really, so this is kind of undemocratic. But from this point on, we can discuss everything. So it's open to anybody, to any commercial partner, and also to consumers as well. And we can kind of uh, discuss, everybody states his needs, we discuss in something like two weeks or three weeks, and then one person will make a suggestion, what we should actually do. And this suggestion can come from anybody, so it's not only me, it can, can come from anybody. And then everybody in this uh, forum I'm gonna show you has the right to veto this suggestion. So we gave this power to everybody. And by, by having this power with everybody's hands, we need to have the magic happening before because if everybody can veto any decision, any suggestion, then you have to come up with a suggestion which is actually able to reach consensus. So you need to ask everybody about their needs and ideas and wishes, and then you have to formulate a suggestion which actually is able to pass through. So the magic kind of happens before. And we do have vetoes, of course, like once or twice a year, which is perfectly all right, I guess. But otherwise, we have no vetoes. So the first prejudice typically with this form of decision making is you will have vetoes all the time. No, won't happen. And the second prejudice is this will take ages if you discuss, which happened at the beginning, I have to admit. But during the past like 16 years, we have a typical decision time frame from two to three weeks. So we give a topic, we discuss for like two weeks, and then somebody gives a suggestion. We wait a few days, mostly a week, and then uh, the decision becomes, uh, the suggestion becomes a decision. And this is, uh, of course, slower than me as the owner just deciding. I could do this in an instant. But it's, I, th I feel it's much smarter because I'm just a single person, and I don't know everything, of course, and I have my personal views and ideas. So. Um, it's, it would be pretty stupid, I guess, to take the decisions on my own. And on the other hand, I think it's much smarter to invite everybody to co-decide and take these two or three weeks, which is all right in the daily business routine. And it's also much quicker than some other companies I have, get to, uh, I have known from the inside. I was working at a university for two years, for example, and sometimes I waited for half a year for my boss to take a decision and I couldn't work because he just wouldn't decide. So this is, of course, it's a little slower than just having a manager deciding, but it's also quicker than some other companies I know. And of course, this decision-making model has its limitations, as every model has, and we had uh, three situations in nearly 17 years where we couldn't reach a consensus, so we kind of blocked ourselves. The first two incidents were about an art picture of the back side of the label and about a line of text on the front side of the label, so minor issues, you could say. But we couldn't agree, we blocked ourselves and we kind of had to shut, shut down the whole company and go bankrupt, which is not an option. So we put out a rule that if we kind of block ourselves, then I'm allowed to take a decision to keep things going. For example, to have a production without any art picture on it, so nobody is um, unhappy about it, there's no image this time, so that's no problem. Or for, for example, one th with a line of text, we have a, a majority vote uh, once because if you don't like the text, this doesn't really hurt you. So this is all right. And the third situation was actually when we had a misproduction. We had the double amount of caffeine in some bottles, which is pretty great, I guess. 
but it's also illegal if the content doesn't match what's on the label. So we have to retract these bottles immediately, which we did. So we had three incidents in 17 years where we needed a management decision. And I do also think that this is a success. So I feel that in a leadership position, if you have to give orders, if you have to force something, if you have to use pressure, then something went wrong before. The other way around, I, I feel that the better your role as a future maybe leadership person uh, worked, then you, you, uh, you hardly have to use it at all. So this is, uh, at least that's how I see it, a success. We do need a management decision once in five years. And um, there's another precaution we have for crises. We had uh, two people in 17 years which uh, stole from us. So we need to be able to defend ourselves as an organization to fire somebody. But this firing process should be very, very hard to execute for everybody to know that you are basically safe. So you can uh, be sick all the time, you can work slow, you can be of a different opinion, you can get on my nerves all the time. That's no problem. Unless you, you cross the red line of deliberately trying to do damage to the company by stealing, for example, then you can be fired. And the process is also pretty much consensus because anybody can nominate anybody else to be fired. And that person loses the right to veto their own firing, of course, otherwise it wouldn't work. But they can still discuss, so they are not silent, they can still discuss, and then we have to reach consensus minus that person. So if I want to have somebody fired, I need to nominate them and then give reasoning, and this reasoning has to be so good that nobody else gives a veto. And this is pretty hard to reach if it's not really by proven incidents that I can show and this person tried to steal, so we need to fire them. And we had this situation twice. So like once in seven and a half years, we have an idiot there. Those of you with working life experience, how often do you have to interact with idiots? <laughs> I think this is pretty great, so um, this worked. And I think this opens up like the second job I do have as a kind of leadership person. First one was to give a very clear direction where the company should go. And second one is to open up a kind of virtual space for everybody to be safe and to find their personal job role, which they like, and to, uh, to maybe to try and to fail also and to discuss and to find common solutions. So there needs to be a huge safe space, basically, where people can kind of develop themselves. This is my second, at least how I see it, role as a main person there. And the third role is to act when things went, went bad. For example, if we block ourselves or if we have a misproduction, double amount of caffeine, then somebody needs to be able to act. And this is also my responsibility to do so. And that's it. So with this model, we have been running the company 17 years, 1,700 commercial partners. So this is a working model which you can uh, use and copy. It's free, so try to use it. We had to move things from personal discussions to the internet. We went to several cities, so we had to, kind of had to find an online decision uh, method, and we used an emailing system for 12 years. So you put an email there, everybody would get it, and every reply would still be delivered to everybody else. This is absolutely unpractical. It's, uh, it was really, really painful, but uh, we, we used this for 12 years and we wrote 18,500 emails to each other. So uh, this is, uh, it was bad, but it was working. And like four years ago, we put up an online forum where you can actually discuss in several areas of topics. And you can um, um, you click, these, click these topics. So if there's something new happening, you will get it by, by email. And you can, of course, look up in the <coughs> area of information what has, what has been discussed before. So in terms of organization, our operating system, I'm going to explain the products, uh, logistics, communication, sales, of course. So this is actually the platform which you can join if you want. You need to have any commercial role with us on the one hand, or you need to, have, you need to drink one bottle at least, meet one member of us in person, and give your real name. That's it because you as consumers are kind of founding and funding us, right? So you need to be able to look up what we are actually doing and you need to be able to co-decide. Like I w uh, was in my bathtub, so this is actually uh, what we still do today. 
And of course, we discuss. So we have this first area of information, and this is the area for discussing. And there's all kinds of topics going on there. And uh, typically, I have to spend like 15 to 30 minutes per day on that platform, which is pretty much all right, I guess, for managing a company. So it's, uh, I think it's also very efficient. And we discuss everything there. And also, we agree on new jobs there. For example, here is an area where we put new jobs, <coughs> which we have to decide upon in consensus, of course. And then we ask who would like to do it. And typically, when companies give jobs to people, then they demand all kinds of uh, resumes, uh, like uh, diplomas from universities, and proof that you can actually do this job, which might sound smart on the first hand. But if you think about it, maybe we have somebody who has learned about accounting like 10 years ago and had several years of experience in accounting. And then this person will get accounting jobs, of course. So this person is kind of stuck in accounting. But we do change over the course of our life. So the things I might be able to do 10 years ago and the things I might like 10 years ago might not be the same as today. So we kind of have to be flexible and adapt to basically the things which people want to do and which they actually can do. And if we have both, so if people work in jobs which they can manage and if, which they like to do, then they are happy. And if we want happy people, we have to kind of be flexible to this and change the job roles which they might already be having. And also, if we have a new job, like an accountant, you put it there. And basically, the first person who would like to try is allowed to try. We do not do heart surgery, of course. So this could be pretty dangerous to have anybody cutting there. But with drinks organization and accounting, I think it's possible. And again, if we approach people like this, I do think that we have more uh, happier co-workers than uh, standard companies which I also can prove. Uh, we have a core group of 11 people which kind of uh, run the whole thing. And uh, we never lost anyone from this core group, so nobody left. But on the other hand, the core group grew over time as the company grew. And we don't have to use any advertising to get new people there, because the people who work there typically start to um, invite their spouse or their neighbors or their friends to also work there which I think is pretty great, because you wouldn't recommend a company where you actually work if it's bad. And you wouldn't recommend somebody to work there who is bad. So it's a kind of positive recommendation um, scheme. And uh, the, in this forum right now, we have 235 uh, members, which are roughly half of them are from commercial partners and half of them are consumers. So we still have a consumer side in there. And this is basically it. So there's the company's uh, decision. Decisions. Here's the area for scientific papers, for example. We had more than 100 scientific papers written about us. And they all found out something different, <laughs> what this is, how this works, why this works, and so on. So if you want to do your final paper, then give us, drop us an email. Maybe we can find something, or you can find something new. And in this forum, we, of course, discuss also about uh, money. Any questions until now? Question, yeah? Why isn't your profit disappearing? <coughs> Sorry? Why isn't your profit disappearing? Like everyone could agree that you don't do any profit. Oh, I'm going to get to the numbers at the, on the next slide. Another question, yeah? Is there going to be a QA actually? Of course. All right. We discuss about money, of course. And we found out that so called normal companies won't. Uh, tell where your money is going. So you buy a product and the company collects the money and does with it whatever they like and they don't even tell you. So this is bad, I think. So it, in order to have an informed consumer deciding where he or she wants to sp spend the money, I think it's, of course, the, the product itself is, is necessary as, a, as an aspect, but also where your money is going is an aspect. So we opened up from the very beginning and put this down to the single bottle so everybody can see where the his or her money is going. And you can get the slides, of course, so this is no secret. And from here, this is the ingredients. Then we have the bottling plant. Then we have shares for our company. We have shares for the wholesaler and the trucking company. We have shares for the dealership and shares for the club and bar owner. And this is, I think, interesting because the actual content of the bottle is just 8.5 cents, so the actual drink. And all the rest is people doing their work. So you, at least that's how I think, you can't leave these 
shares to the forces of the so-called free market. And you can't leave these shares to the owners of the company. They're deciding upon this, but you have to decide with, about this with everybody and also with the consumers, of course. And when you open up your costing structure, then several things happen. For example, we have very rare discussions about the prices because we can just argue what the price actually is and why. So there's very few uh, discussions and problems about this. Then I feel that this opening up has contributed to a high level of trust with our commercial partners, so they know where their money is going as well. And um, we also look different uh, upon several things which are kind of mandatory, at least that's how you learn it, for companies. For example, it's considered mandatory to have an advertising budget somewhere. You have to have a share somewhere for advertising. But advertising is, in most cases, well, unwanted communication. So you go to a website, there's some advertisement coming up. You go through the streets, there's a billboard addressing you. you I don't know, there's all kinds of unwanted communication which, which try to force their advertising messages onto you. And this is one problem. And the other problem is that you are actually paying for this because these companies have a share somewhere, four to eight cents per bottle, like one or two euros per crate, which they collect from you and then use the money to get on your nerves with advertising which we feel is a stupid idea to do. So we don't have any budget for advertising. And of course, things are a little slower without advertising, of course, but as I explained before, I think it's necessary to find an own speed of developing a company, so it was all right to be slower. And still, until today, we don't have any budget for advertising. We do communications, of course, and we do so-called pull communication. So. We put up a website, which is very cheap, like 200 euros or so, and then you can actually go there and visit it. So you are pulling the information. Don't do it, it's pretty much outdated, but you are kind of pulling the information in this case. Or maybe here, you come here for listening to a talk, then I'm allowed to talk. So you are kind of pulling the information right now. This is okay, I think, to offer, but you shouldn't be offering push communication, which communicates without you even asking for it, right? And this is the expensive part. So we kind of had the idea that there should be no advertising budget, basically. And the second thing, which is also not listed here, maybe you can't read it, is uh, any profit. So now things get interesting, right? We feel that if we pay the suppliers and the workers, and maybe we put aside a share for crises, like one cent per bottle, and then we work throughout the year and at the end of the year there's some money left, then I think we made a mistake. Because either we didn't give the suppliers enough or we took more money from you than actually needed for the supplies and the workers and some preparation for crises and that should be it. So the main idea of having profits is basically to exploit either you or the suppliers to have this share somewhere. And in the so-called standard business environment, this is considered success to have big profits. But I think this is insane because it kind of sets the wrong incentives. If we had this as a secret, I wouldn't show this to you. Then I could, of course, rise my share by pressing on the suppliers. I could rise my share by rising the prices and have a nice advertising and tell you you're going to be happy and beautiful and everything with Odinkus Cola. And then I would kind of be rewarded for behaving bad in society. So this is something we don't want to do. So our financial goal is to have all expenses covered and one cent for crises put aside and that should be it. So it's a kind of black zero. And in this model, there's a share for everybody involved here, which, which is per bottle and it translates to an hourly wage. I'm coming to this. So we kind of have no method of rising their own share uh, by uh, treating somebody else bad. So if I want to earn more, for example, I have to work for the company in a way that everybody gets more. And this is something which I think is the better incentive to actually have instead of maximizing the profits on somebody else's expenses. And of course, we do have salaries, and we have, of course, the same salary for everybody. As we have the same human dignity of people, then we should have the same salary on a base level. So it's uh, 18 euros per hour right now. It's the base salary per hour. 
but we do have, of course, people with more uh, needs for money. For example, if you do have kids, you need more money to feed the kids. So if you have kids, you will get a rise per kid. And if you have a handicap, then you typically need more um, uh, special uh, maybe living environment, maybe some special tools, maybe a special car. So you need more money if you have a handicap. So you will get a rise with the percentage of your handicap which is in your passport. This is one way how we put it. And if you have a job which is not already at a given location, like the bottling plant or a truck or something, if you need a desk somewhere, then, then you will get uh, um, an additional share for paying for that desk. So for example, for the rent, if you work from home, or if you go to a co-working space and rent a desk there, then we will cover that desk. And that's basically it. So we have the same salary, of course, for everybody, including me, of course. And I can't think of any other way to, to do it because all right, we discussed as the owner of the company, I'm taking the risk, I'm taking responsibility, I founded it, I put in the first years, all right. But without, for example, Katya doing the accounting, this would just be an idea. Without Michael driving the truck, this would just be an idea. Without Alex running the production plan, this would just be an idea. So I feel that there is no job which should be paid better than other jobs, or if we have different payments, then we should think about which job have the jobs have the best contribution to society. And this is also absolutely different than the so-called standard payments are because, for example, if you are a manager from, a, from an insurance company or if you, I don't know, um, rent houses and connect buyers and uh, homeowners, then you get, will get a high share. Uh, if you have an advertising agency, then you get a higher share, but the actual benefit for the society is very small, if not zero, zero in these jobs. And on the other hand, if you care for elderly people and uh, um, uh, wash them and care for them and so on, then it's a very vital job for society, I guess. So these people should be getting paid more. Or if you build something from roads, if you collect garbage, these are the uh, jobs which are uh, stressful, which take, um, which are uh, harmful to the body. So these so-called low-qualified jobs, I think they should be getting more if any difference should be made. And we feel that we need to have a same salary for everybody. So this is uh, our model right now. Now imagine you work for a company where the official owner argues that I don't want to take the decisions. I want to decide with you. And also, I don't want to collect the profits because this is a bad idea. So you can imagine that's a whole different story of uh, how we work together. And I've brought some slides from Elena, which, which is working for us for like four years right now. And she compared, of course, in German, uh, the standard working environment, which she also knows, with, with ours. So in the standard working environment, to cut things a little bit, she says there's a predefined working time frame and the working location which the boss gives her and there's a predefined content of the job which she actually has to do and she gets told how to do it and uh, until when and so on so it's all kinds of orders from somebody else and then this is our her working uh, working life and then she has her free time before and after that and this is considered normal now, I don't get it because we, we can, in many jobs, uh, let things go. So she decides where she's working, when she's working, how much she's working, and this can change, of course. She picks the jobs which she wants to do and so on. So this is a whole different story of uh, letting go and making people happy by giving them the choice. And we do have people like Elena who will come up every three months and demand something new she could do, which is pretty unnerving sometimes, but we have to meet this demand if we want to make her happy. And we have other members which give themselves a fixed time frame from 9 to 1 every day. I work there and I do this job and check on Excel sheets, which I find pretty boring, but they like it, so that, all right. And we just have to kind of put together the, uh, the like pieces of a puzzle, everybody's ideas and thoughts and uh, abilities to have a working company in the whole. And then they will get happier because, as she put it, Elena, in a talk at the University of Hamburg, in the standard working life, this is all predefined by somebody else. It's her working time frame. And she has to arrange her private life before or after that. And with us, she can arrange her private life 
and then arrange the working life around this, right? Right now, she's, for example, she's um, building a, a mobile home, so she doesn't work too much for like four weeks or so, which is pretty much all right. And in summer, she usually goes to festivals, so you, she also works less, and in winter, she works more, so it's pretty much all right, and we have uh, a happier member by, by doing so. And she knows that we don't have any written contracts, of course, so on the legal side, she could lose her job now, but she also knows that I would need consensus minus one if, we want, if I want to have her fired. And she feels very safe. She's ex expressing this in the video. She feels very safe in this surrounding and also safer than a standard surrounding. Because in a standard surrounding, if you have a contract, this might look stable. But if the boss doesn't like you, he can just cancel the contract and have you fired. And this is, in our case, it's not that easy. It's pr actually pretty hard. So she feels even safer than with the contract. These are her, her words. The video is online. You can look it up. She also states that it's a challenge sometimes to work in such a flexible fashion. She has to kind of adapt and learn to, to work in, um, in that way. She has to motivate herself. She needs to be at the computer and be concentrated. And she has some responsibility for the things she took over. So, so this can be a challenge. She, these are her slides, so I'm not going to hide them. And uh, this can be a challenge, of course. But if we meet this challenge, and if we are able to care for her personal needs and wishes and arrange the company around it, then I think something gets clear or visible, which is, in my opinion, that we don't produce drinks, actually. We kind of are a service provider, maybe, to care for everybody which we have a connection with and to treat them so well that they actually stay so we can work with them. And if we manage to do that, then we will have bottles as a result and we can deliver the bottles and sell the bottles. So the bottles are kind of the pillars of the actual job which we do. We try to care for people uh, which are involved here. And of course, there's always change, like I explained. So somebody will have a private problem, somebody will have a renovation, somebody will have a divorce. So there's change all the time, and we have to kind of, this is an static image, of course, but we have to view this as a, as a moving image and kind of interact here a little to, to tweak things, interact there push a little here, block a little there. So it's a kind of moving image, which, uh, uh, which we have to kind of um, actually know and, and care for. And the bottles are, re are a result. Strange, right? <laughs> I learned this like a few years ago, and I was pretty astonished. All right. I would personally have the, the, the wish that other companies work in a similar fashion. So I thought we should tell them that it's possible. So we put out our system in 2008 on our website, grouped 50 modules, like the things I explained, which we actually do, in uh, three areas of sustainability. And this happened by accident. I didn't even know the term. So we had to come up with some grouping. And I looked up several possible methods. And this seemed to be pretty much all right, because we have to kind of balance the ecological issues, the social and the economic issues. And if we are able to manage, manage this, to balance this, then we are considered sustainable. But uh, actually, today, I'm seeing this model a little bit uh, different, because we do only have one planet. And we have been damaging it pretty much, so it's already heating up. And um, I think the, the priorities must change here. So. If we bla balance things here and we still are destroying the planet, then we don't have a planet to live on. So we need to have this maybe uh, upwards here or maybe even more important. And by putting this online, we made this for free, of course. So it's a free license. It's CC by SA from the hacking culture. So you can use it and change it, of course. And you have to please tell where you got it from. And uh, you should pass along uh, your tweaks uh, to others. So it's a kind of open source uh, model. And the problem is that other drinks producers then can use this model. So we are kind of helping our competitors for free to get better, which might sound like a stupid idea. But then I was thinking, how can I again rethink, rewrite the, the system? And I thought that maybe competition is also a bad idea. Because competition would mean that I have to kind of 
well, force my way into the market and m sometimes even buy myself into the dealership structures and use advertising and compete with other drinks producers. So at least how I would see it, waste energy in fighting others. And if I could manage to establish a network of producers which actually cooperate, then all this energy doesn't have to be wasted. <coughs> and that's what I did. <coughs> so this is from a scientific paper which analyzed our cooperational partners and the red connections are partners which we actually have and which were interviewed. The yellow ones are partners which you also have which weren't interviewed. And the blue ones, I actually have no idea whether why they're in there, but these the red and yellow connections are uh, our cooperational partners. Now imagine these like 25 partners or so we are cooperating with, like we are sharing logistics, we are sharing people, we are sharing money, of course, also. And if I would have to compete with all of them, what, what a waste of time and energy and money that would be. So I think it's pretty much better to avoid competition and to actually cooperate. <coughs> we do have three sizes of cola right now. There's also a beer, which I also founded. And <coughs> then there's a mate lemonade and an elderflower lemonade, which has been founded by David and Roman from, from Freiburg. So uh, they look the same, they work the same, but they are economically speaking on a second um, pillar. And there's also a third product which other members founded. So we do have three formal uh, companies right now. And we serve as, um, uh, we, give, we give jobs to the people uh, which work for us. But we are not only one company, which could be a legal problem in Germany, but we are three companies and we don't give any orders. So there's no problem here. And the sales also do look good. So these are the several products and the sales are rising most of the time, which is pretty good. <coughs> but it can be also pretty bad if the rise is too quickly. I think that with every organism and with every organization, there's a kind of healthy window of the growth speed. And there's also a kind of healthy window of the actual size of the company. So in the first seven and a half years, the company was too small to even give the founder a share, which is too small. Then we had the, I think, medium size, which is all right. And we will have maybe at some point in the future a size where we lose contact to our partners because there are too many. So there's a medium size window, I guess, for every organization to function properly. And also with every organism, if I would like three meters, uh, grow to three meters tall, I would have bone pain on something. So there's a uh, size and speed window. And with the speed window, we broke it here. The growth was too quick. So we couldn't uh, fuel and we couldn't pay the next bigger production and the next bigger production and the next bigger production. So we were bankrupt because the growth was too quick. And we didn't see that coming. So we were <coughs> pretty much um, scared what we should do now. And maybe I took this have, had to take these slides to a bank and get a loan from them, but I didn't want to have an investor. So I was unsure what to do. And then the two biggest wholesalers we have, Norbert and Angelo, they called and offered to help to pay quicker, which is great. Those of you with job experience, did you ever hear that your biggest customer who knows he's your biggest customer calls and offers to pay quicker? This rarely ever happens, so this happened here. And also um, they put it in a very interesting um, um, wording. They said, we have a problem so we can pay quicker and help. And this is great because they also could have put it like you have a problem and we are willing to help, which would be also great. But they understood that it's, this is a we, we are working together. So this is great. And last year we had a decline in sales due to the fact that we have a large festival in Germany, it's Fusion Festival, and they were making a break for a year. So we lost their uh, bottles uh, last year. And we found out in the middle of the year, and I talked to the group with our yearly meeting and explained to them we have a decline in sales. So we might be having to lower the salaries from 20 euros to 18 euros if we don't kind of push ourselves and find some new customers to have a zero growth rate at least. And this is what I suggested, to give ourselves the goal of a zero growth rate. And they declined and gave vetoes because they felt that they would have then pressure to work, to find new customers, to sell, which is pressure. It's a low level of pressure, but it's still pressure. And they disagreed. So we discussed and I argued that if we don't make it, then we will have to lower the sales, uh, the salaries. 
And they agreed in the middle of the year and also at the end of the year, it didn't happen. So we had to lower the salaries from 20 euros to 18 euros, which is pretty interesting, I guess, because it, at least that's how I see it, tells uh, two, uh, two facts. First fact is, for the people who work there, it's very, very important to work with as few, as, as less pressure as possible. And they would even lower their own salary to have less pressure, which is, I think, pretty great. And also, the salary seems to be enough. Because with 18 euros per hour, it's something like 2,800 euros per month. I never even calculated it. And I do think that we have to have a sufficient salary for everybody. So you can food, feed yourself, you can pay for your uh, rent, or maybe if you buy something, you pay for to the bank. You have to have holidays, you have to have hobbies, and so on. So there needs to be a sufficient salary, but that's it. Because in, in, in a limited world, we can't have more of resources and of consumption and of goods all the time. We need to tone it down a little. So we need to have a sufficient salary to, be a peop to make people happy, but that's it. And this salary seems to be sufficient with 18 euros because otherwise they wouldn't have lowered themselves to 18 euros. And uh, then the real problems came up. I got a call from German tax authority. We will be coming next Monday. We want to have a look at the three years in the past and uh, we will check if you did your taxes correctly. And remember that we have an accounting girl who never had any experience in accounting before. <laughs> she was organizing parties 10 years before and then moved to accounting. So I was very afraid. And also the German tax authorities, they are very powerful. They can shut down a company now if they feel it's not being accounted properly. So I was afraid. And also, um, maybe you have noticed that I'm a kind of maybe careful, maybe over careful person. Maybe I'm a coward. So I try to avoid problems and risks as good as I could. So I never used all these tricks which you can do with taxes. So I try to stick to, the, to these rules. I try to stick to them. And also, we made room for Katya, the accounting girl, to be a very, very good accounting girl. So in the end, we got out of this check with no complaints at all which is very rare in Germany, because in fact, these uh, tax accountants, they have a, a goal to meet. So uh, de depending on the size and the industry of the company, they should have, uh, beef, uh, they should have found 3% of um, uh, problems there, but they couldn't find anything, so this is great. And this would be great for a standard company, but for such a company, I think it's extra great that with this approach we were able to meet the tax uh, regulations uh, and have no complaints at all. And with this, I think we have given the final proof that it is possible to work in the framework of capitalism, which I of course don't like, but we are right now in this framework and to work there. We have the German law system, of course, which abides to us and we abide to it, so we have no problems there, no lawsuits. And we have the tax regulations as well, we don't have a problem there. So from a system perspective, we are a 100% compatible company, right? No questions asked. But still, we have turned very many things around, so this is, I think, proof that it's actually possible to do it. You can work in this system and still hack it. And then I had the dream to help other companies to develop themselves as well. So to become a kind of consultant, but as a consultant, I would need a suit maybe. I would need an MBA degree maybe. So I didn't have all of this. So I started just by, well, offering free advice to companies and build a list of references for like 20 companies. And I dreamt of one or two big company names to put on this list. And then I wanted to go public and offer this as a service. And then I um, asked a German foundation to, to uh, fuel a three years project of actually learning how to be a consultant. And we went to 12 other companies to help them. And I've learned something in every company which is in, uh, valid in every company I visited. And the first thing we learned here 
we went to a caring facility for elderly people and they found out that they have a house with like uh, 500 uh, guests and they were wasting uh, like uh, 500 meals per month in this house so they had a specialized um, plan which food should be made where should it be distributed and so on and the plan didn't meet the reality so they wasted 500 meals um, per month and then I asked stupid questions. I asked them if they ever had asked the guests what they actually would like to eat and how much. They never did. And if they would ask the main kitchen which meals are actually complicated so they will arrive more often than others in a dry and um, uh, cold fashion so then, then they won't be eaten. And they asked both of these groups, so the people which are affected basically, which they never did before, found better solutions and made, uh, made the progress that in two houses, like a uh, thousand meals per month, they didn't waste after we went there. So this is the first thing which worked in every company I visited, improve the, uh, the exchange between the people which are affected. Because the main kitchen from them, th this was a, a separate company and they considered it to be external. So they never spoke to them because they are external. But they are not. They are a main supplier, so they should be considered as an internal, and you have to fuel this, this exchange. Then I went to German National Railway Provider, 2015, and we worked together uh, with a leadership model, and I gave three um, suggestions, which, which they all took over, so we worked together pretty closely. But they never paid, because uh, they had no budget, because, yeah, I don't know, they, they had no budget. So I went there six whole days and gave as much advice as I could and still talked about, well, I think I should be getting something at least. And they, did, they agreed, but they didn't have any budget. So um, it took me three years. Uh, this year I made it, I had a contract from them. They wanted to have a contract to give them advice and we tried to use consensus in the Frankfurt um, business uh, area of them. And the second thing which I've learned in all companies I visited is, the bigger the company is, the longer uh, time it takes to change it. So this is a very big company, 300,000 employees, takes ages to change and it took us three years alone to even try to use consensus in a certain um, IT department. And then I had, still I didn't have any paying customer and then I had my first paying customer. I got an email from the government of the United Arab Emirates and they explained they had just googled for people with experience with alternative forms of running companies and found me and they wanted to invite me. And I couldn't believe it first. And uh, I looked them up and it turned out to be true and we met in Freiburg once with a few members of them and then I was supposed to, to fly there but of course I don't want to fly for ecological reasons. So we discussed and found out that there is a train, takes four weeks. It's <laughs> rather dangerous for a white Caucasian uh, person. You can take a ship, it takes three weeks per direction and you will be offline of course on the ship. And they were arguing they can send me a, a smaller plane just for myself to go there, no. <laughs> and in the end we agreed that they would pay for a business class trip and I would fly economy and we would compensate the emissions 20 times, which kind of figured would be okay because I saw the chance to put ideas to the government there. So I went there and helped them in a, a state-driven uh, research facility. They, had, um, they have a high level of uh, immigration, which they actually need. And of course, they do have problems with immigration as well. So they have an own scientific institute analyzing the effects and causes and the possible um, um, uh, uh, yeah, things you can do about immigration. And they had 50 mostly female researchers and four mostly male managers with old style management. Assignment of jobs, assignment of job hours, assignment of location, assignment of penalties, assignment of bonuses, old style management. And these researchers, they were usually smart, so they worked there until they were like 35 and then they left. They were fed up. So they wanted to kind of find a way to basically uh, have this loss of employees uh, reduced. And I asked them something which also works in every company I visited until today. I asked them to keep their command structure in place so you can react if something goes wrong, but give the goal to these uh, managers and also to the, to the workers 
to almost never use the structure. So you have it in place, there are managers, they could give orders, but the goal is to not use these, pow these powers. And this is something which worked out pretty well, so they were able to reduce the loss of workers uh, by 50%, so this is pretty great. And they used the, uh, they, they, um, they kind of overdid it, so they allowed everybody to work where and when and how much and what now with everybody. And I was arguing that th there's a process needed, you need to train the people and give them coaches to enable this and to give it some time, of course, and they kind of ordered freedom <laughs> right now. So right now we are talking that I might return them, this was two years ago, and uh, maybe help them to establish a process with this. And they paid like 7,000 euros for uh, eight days, which is a standard junior consultant uh, fee. And I asked the collective if I'm allowed to keep it. I was allowed to keep one third of it. So uh, I renovated my kitchen with it. So it's also pretty great. And now I am a kind of consultant with uh, some customers and some clients. So yeah, also pretty funny to talk about this. And there's a third project, which is just started recently. And I don't want to have this public yet. So I'm asking you to turn off the camera. And this is also my last uh, topic, so uh, then I'm open to questions. And now you can turn on the camera again. <laughs> my last few slides. What do I get out of it to work in this fashion? I do have sufficient money, 18 euros per hour, pretty much all right. I have everything I need. I have very many happy partners, so it's pretty much stable, and I don't have to worry about my income next month. I think I do have a great level of freedom to go here, to say things which I like, to look the way I want to, so I have all kinds of freedom to work things I want to work. And I also feel that I have a meaningful job. You could argue about if we do need cola, but I feel that I'm caring for people, so I'm doing something contributing to society, making life easier for people. I do have quite some reach, so I'm here every semester and be allowed to talk to you students, which is great, and you will be taking home some of the ideas probably, and hopefully uh, you will pass them along, so I have some reach for my ideas. I can start new projects when I feel like it, so I have some kind of personal development, so I, can, I can move forward. And uh, the, the seventh factor is, um, most friends of mine who have standard jobs, they have to maintain two sides of their personality. So they are like my friend named Max in his private life, and I know him pretty well, and he has his, his ideas and so on. And then he goes to an advertising company doing advertising for cars and has a boss and has clients, and he has to show a different side of him and he has to, has to kind of well, even mask himself to, to work there which drives him insane and, uh, well, I don't have to do it. I can just say the things I like and think and there's just one person, which is pretty relieving uh, not to um, have two sides of my personality. And when I started this, I had no money, thousand euros, so very few little money. I had no strategy, I had no plan, I had no real idea how I wanted to run things. I just knew how I wouldn't want to run things. And I'm not too smart, I'm not too educated, I'm just a kind of regular guy. But still, I was able to put up such projects. Maybe because I decided not to follow all the rules. Maybe I put in some years of, um, of building it up, all right, but that's it. So I think it's possible for a single person to m actually make a difference. So you can start maybe your impossible project. You can even start your own company. You can rewrite the rules of business. Obviously you can. You can hack business, if you want to put it like this. And you can make a difference in the world. And also, please don't believe your professor. <laughs> Thank you.